Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our service here this evening at the Tron. Uh, it's good to see you and to welcome you, and uh, very especially if you're here visiting with us, and uh, particularly if you're here for the first time. Let me welcome you warmly in the name of the church fellowship here, and uh, I hope that uh, you won't have to rush away too quickly afterwards. There'll be uh, tea and coffee and cold drinks and so on served downstairs uh, after the service, and uh, we'd love for you to stay and get to know one another and encourage one another uh, in the Lord. We're delighted today that we have uh, as our guest preacher both this morning and this evening, Simon Manchester. Simon's been with us uh, from Sydney, Australia, uh, all of this week teaching our pastor's training course, and it's been a delight to have uh, him and Kathy here with us. We uh, greatly enjoyed his ministry this morning and are so glad and grateful, Simon, that you're here uh, to preach again this evening. And we look forward to that very much indeed. Simon's going to be uh, speaking particularly this evening on the subject of God as Trinity. And uh, so we're going to begin by singing a hymn about our God, the triune God. You'll find it in these blue books at number 151. And you'll see the hymn there. Glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son. Glory be to God the Spirit. Great I am, the three in one. This is our God. And so we sing to his praise and glory. Number 151. Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts in prayer. Let's pray. We come to you, our Heavenly Father, and we come in the name of Jesus, your Son, and we come through the Holy Spirit, by whom we, like Jesus himself, cry to you, Abba, Father, your Holy Spirit, who bears witness even now with our spirits that we are children of God, that we are 
fellow heirs with Christ. The Holy Spirit who one day will raise our mortal bodies also to be like his glorious body, alive forever, to share in that glory of the new creation where even now he is glorified above every other creature. The Holy Spirit who leads us to the Lord Jesus Christ to love him and to glorify him and to obey him alone as Lord and King of our lives and so also to bring glory to our Heavenly Father. For you love to see Jesus, your Son, glorified in this world and you are yourself glorified in the Son. How we rejoice, Lord, that you and none other, that you are our God, that we have not a distant God, a dark God, an unknown God, a God beyond us in the sense of, of being hidden and shrouded in mystery, but a God who has drawn near, who has come into our world, into our lives, right into our own hearts, so that we might know something of the love that is of your very being, of your very essence. You who are loved and who has loved perfectly and purely within your own perfect being from all eternity, but have wonderfully chosen to make that love overflow abundantly towards us through Jesus Christ, your Son. So, Lord, we pray that you would make us to know you more and to be able to love you more for the sake of your great love for us expressed so perfectly and fully in Jesus Christ, your Son. And so, Lord, we ask, draw near to us by your same Holy Spirit that he might glorify Jesus and glorify you, our Father, even as our hearts are touched this evening and opened to his words that lead us afresh to the Savior and lead us to be your children and to honor you and glorify you in our lives. So this is our evening prayer, and we ask it and bring it in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. I'm going to sing again another hymn all about our God, the God of the ages, number 257, God of the ages, history's maker, planning our pathway, holding us fast, shaping in mercy all that concerns us, Father we praise you, Lord, of the past and of the present and of the future. 257.
Let me just uh, mention one or two notices this evening. Uh, if you were here this morning, you'll have one of these sheets. Uh, if you didn't get one uh, on the way in this evening, do pick one up on the uh, trolleys outside the doors there. Uh, there are lots of notes there about uh, events this coming week, all the usual things, uh, and some other notices for the future too. So do, uh, do pick one up and have a read and make sure that you're uh, informed about those, uh, if only uh, for your prayers so that we can be praying together as a fellowship throughout the week for all these things that are going on. Uh, remember all the usual things, the uh, various Bible studies going on through the week, the lunchtime service on Wednesday, uh, Thursday evening when we have Release the Word, the International's Bible studies, uh, and of course Christianity Explored. Please do have that in your prayers very particularly as that course gets towards uh, its middle. Uh, just two things to mention for the future. As I said this morning, uh, bookings for the uh, Scripture Union camps for the summer are out, and uh, LM3B is the particular camp at Lindrick Muir that many of our church here are involved in, uh, leading in the team, uh, along with Paul and Katie. And uh, I'm sure many of you will want to make the opportunity known to others, perhaps to your own kids, their friends, to grandchildren, uh, to the kids of neighbors and so on and others. It'd be lovely just to have a great number of young folk at that camp to make the very most of the opportunities that we have. Uh, to share the gospel with them. So do be thinking about that. Do chat to Paul and Katie. I'm sure they'll be glad to uh, tell you more and uh, n n tell you how you can find out uh, all about that. Then also one that I didn't mention this morning, and that is that uh, there's a, coming, a meeting coming up of the Christian Institute. Uh, as you know, we're uh, very keen supporters of this Christian Institute in the church here. Uh, I'm a trustee of it and will actually be at the trustees meeting all day on Thursday down in Newcastle, so I value your prayers for that. It's always a long day, but a very uh, rewarding day. But on the 18th of February, Thursday the 18th at 7.30 in the Church of the Nazarene in Govan, there's a, a, a regional meeting and there'll be opportunities there to hear about the work and some of the particular campaigns and so on uh, that are in the headlines at the moment and which the Institute is involved in uh, both legal cases and also uh, seeking to influence for good uh, the policy making of the government both here in Scotland and at Westminster so I commend that to you but as I say do pick up these leaflets have a read of them and uh, use them uh, to aid your prayers we're going to turn to our Bibles to read this evening as I said Simon is going to be speaking not so much on a Bible passage but on uh, the uh, doctrine really of the Trinity the nature of uh, our God but we're going to read together some verses from Ephesians uh, the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, and uh, if you have a visitor's Bible, you'll find it, I think, on page 976, and we read from verses 3 to 14 of Ephesians chapter 1. So Paul the Apostle says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the Beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things in on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. 
Amen. Well, these are indeed majestic words, and we're going to meditate on them further as we sing our next hymn on the screens, uh, a lovely song written by uh, our good friend Peter Dixon from this chapter. In Christ we have this precious gift, redemption through his blood. Well, now as the musicians play quietly, our offerings for the Lord's work will be received. You might like to meditate on the scriptures we've read, or perhaps just to be quietly in prayer. But as we do that, our offerings are received.
Let's pray. The music says, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my Sovereign die? Did he devote that sacred head for such a one as I? Was it for sins that I had done he suffered on the tree? Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in when God, the mighty maker, died for man, the creature's sin. So might I hide my blushing face while his dear cross appears, dissolve my heart in thankfulness and melt my eyes to tears. Dear Savior, how can I repay the debt of love I owe? Lord, take my very self, I pray. My all I give to you. Lord, this is, and indeed may it truly be, the prayer of our hearts and of our lives as we live in the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in heaven, made manifest purely and perfectly and fully and wonderfully for all this world to see in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to understand it. Help us to take it in what it meant for you, the Holy One, to take away our sin. Help us to understand the God who is our God, the God of Scripture, the God made known in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, as we come to your word, we come 
reverently. We come with awe. And we ask that you would open our eyes and the eyes of our hearts that we might understand wonderful things from this your law. For Jesus' sake. Amen. So before we come then to God's word, we're going to sing again another screen hymn. Now in reverence and awe we gather round your word. Well, good evening, dear friends, and thank you again for the welcome you've given to Kathy and myself. It's been an absolute treat to be at the Tron for this last week, and the days have been cold, but you have been warm. The days have been short. Your kindnesses have been long. Your words have been incomprehensible, <laughs> but you've meant well. We've had a great time, and I said this morning, I hope you'll continue to pray for your pastoral team because the leadership of this uh, church is a blessing beyond the Tron and uh, reaches down into the encouragements we've received down in Sydney. Now, uh, William has prayed, and we've sung a prayer, so I'm just going to go straight to the task, and I want to begin by reminding you of an old story you may have heard of of four men who are traveling in a small plane. There's a pilot, a brilliant professor, a bishop, and a student. And as they're traveling, the engines fail, and the pilot radios back and says to the men in the plane, I'm sorry to tell you, the engines have failed, and we're going to have to bail out. And because there's only three parachutes, and I own the plane and the parachutes, I'm taking one, and out he goes. 
And the brilliant professor then stands up and says to the other two, you know, I'm so intelligent. We owe it to the world to keep me alive. So he said, I'm taking one as well, and out he goes. And the old bishop then stands up and says to the student, you know, young man, I've lived a long life. I'm ready to meet my maker. I'd be very glad for you to take the last parachute. And the student says, well, sir, that won't be necessary. There are still two parachutes. And the bishop says, how could that be possible? There were only three. And the student says, the brilliant professor's just jumped out with my rucksack. <laughs> and I tell you that because uh, is it not interesting that there are things that sometimes look extremely relevant to us, like a rucksack, which are actually, in the moment, of very limited value. And the thing that looks less relevant or irrelevant, like a parachute, in the right moment is of crucial value. And I want to suggest to you this evening that the doctrine of the Trinity, which is an unusual topic for a sermon, may look irrelevant and impractical, but actually it is of immeasurable value. And by the Trinity, I mean, of course, that there is one God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I think I'm telling you the truth this evening when I tell you that the Trinity shows us what life is for, and that the Trinity tells us how to get on with people, and that the Trinity tells us why Christ and the way of Christ is the only non-fiction religion in the world. In the past in history, uh, everybody pretty well who went to church was familiar with the Trinity. So when Columbus sailed in 1492 and came across some lands that looked like three lands, and then he came closer and saw that they were really one, he named the place Trinidad, the Spanish word for Trinity, good Catholic boy. And our forgetting of the Trinity, which we do so easily, because we tend to focus on the Father, or the Son, or the Holy Spirit, but forget the Trinity. It's not as though we're losing something like an old antique, which we can really do without. When we lose or forget the Trinity, it's a, it's a little bit more like spiritual dementia. Everything gets cloudier. And I thought it might be good this evening to say just a few things to get you thinking about the Trinity. Maybe reading on the subject. One of the good books on your bookstall is called The Good God. A little paperback which will stimulate you and refresh you. And my hope is that you'll begin to see that everything, 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 everything relates to the Trinity. And that you won't fall into what is called deism that some god has sort of wound the world up and walked away, which is becoming very popular. You know, there is a god, but he's distant. Or you won't fall, on the other hand, into pantheism, that there's lots of random gods. This is also becoming very popular, but that you will celebrate Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And even as you pray, even perhaps before you fall asleep, you might remember as you send up a an end of day prayer, you might remember that you're speaking to the Father because of the Son with the help of the Holy Spirit. Now it's a topical subject which is not my favorite type of preaching and it's probably not your favorite either. I would rather be digging into one passage but every now and again there is a time for a topical talk and so I thought I would just spend a few minutes talking to you about the fact of the Trinity, then the importance of the Trinity and then the necessity of the Trinity. First of all the fact we may feel a little defensive when we raise the subject of the Trinity, and you can imagine if the Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door and say to you, as they may, you know, your religion is sort of very inventive, isn't it, coming up with this doctrine of the Trinity, and we feel a little bit defensive um, because it's not a Bible word, and there's no illustration which will really explain the Trinity and do justice. There's no human illustration. And a great deal of theology, if you ever read more meatily on the subject, is pretty negative, telling us what the Trinity isn't and all the dangers. But let me say this, and this is perhaps one of the two most important things to say to you this evening. You will be a Trinity person if you get Jesus. If you get Jesus, if you understand who he is, if you believe in him and belong to him and seek to behave for him, you will be a Trinitarian person. Because if you get your Bible and you start to read on the desert island from left to right 
and you come to the part that tells you that there is one God and then you keep reading and you know there's only one God and then you come to Jesus and suddenly you're face to face with somebody who is real and historical who talks like God and acts like God and you've got to make a decision that this person Jesus is God and you come to the point in the words of Philippians 2 where you kneel down before him and you declare that he is Lord Paul borrows the Yahweh word from Isaiah. You declare that Jesus is Yahweh to the glory of God the Father. And then, of course, you begin to read about the Holy Spirit and you see that the Holy Spirit, according to Jesus, is a he, not an it, and that he does all sorts of things that people do. He guides, he grieves, he researches, he leads, he does all sorts of things that people do, personal things, and you realize that there is one God and three persons. It is true that there is not the Trinity word in Scripture, but the Christmas word is not in Scripture either, yet we do believe in the incarnation, and the Easter word is not in Scripture, yet we do believe in the resurrection. No, the word Trinity is not in Scripture, but the reality is in Scripture. And uh, Jim Packer says in one of his essays the trinity is the christian name for god you might like to think about that when you're engaging in conversation with people that by speaking about god and falling into the trap of what they think about god you might rescue that conversation by talking about belief in god father son and holy spirit it's also true that there's no illustration that explains the Trinity. So people have come up with sort of ice, water, steam, or a man who's a father, a son, and a builder, or the light which has got sort of radiance and heat, or the three-leaf clover. All of these illustrations fail. Um, I've noticed uh, Gerald Bray in one of his books speaks about the atom which looks from the outside to be one but of course inside is multiple but actually when he uses that illustration he recognizes that that doesn't do justice to the Trinity he's really teaching that uh, outside Christianity if you are outside Christianity God looks like just one but when you enter into Christianity you see that he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I find the fact that none of these illustrations do justice to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit really very comforting because it just reminds me again that this God who has confronted the world is not something that we have invented, but that he has come to us and forced us to face him. So as somebody has said, the doctrine of the Trinity is humbling, but it's not foolish. It's also true that theology is often guarding against various dangers. But again, this is very helpful to us because it's fencing away unhelpful ideas and just bringing us to the biblical reality that we're face to face with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when you do face up to Jesus in the New Testament by reading Mark's Gospel or John's Gospel or something like that, and you realize that Jesus is a historical person, he's a unique person, he's the supreme person, he's human and he's God, he's the door to fellowship with the Father. And he's the door to fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Once you have faith in Jesus, you immediately are a Trinitarian person. As soon as you put your faith in Jesus, that minute you have a Father in heaven, you have a Savior, and you have the Holy Spirit indwelling. You can't get the Trinity one by one. You can't believe in God one year and then Jesus the next and get the Holy Spirit the next. Relating to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit comes all together. And I wonder whether that's why Paul, in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, that famous grace verse which we often finish meetings with, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ begins the threesome with the person of Jesus because he is the way in to the Trinity. Well, this Trinity is, is uh, hinted at in the Old Testament. You know, think of phrases like holy, holy, holy in Isaiah 6. But the Trinity is really very clear in the New Testament. So just remember, for example, in case you think, well, the Trinity is not very obvious to me. Think, for example, about when Jesus is being baptized and he walks into the water and the Father speaks publicly from heaven 
and the Holy Spirit descends on him as a dove would descend on him. Or think about when Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus and he gets to the point of saying, you know, God so loved the world that he sent his son and the son must be lifted up and the person who believes in him will be reborn because the spirit moves where he wills. Or think also of the Last Supper where Jesus is sitting with the disciples and he says, in my father's house are many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you, another counsellor. Or think of Jesus' prayer in John 17, where he speaks to the Father. He, the Son, speaks to the Father, asking the Father to protect them and to look after them and to lead them. Or think about the commission in Matthew chapter 28. Go and make disciples in the name singular of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are lots of texts which actually you could find the Trinity in the text. And there are lots of passages like Ephesians chapter 1, which of course lay out the adopting, redeeming, sealing Trinity. So the Trinity is a fact. I don't want you to be nervous about the Trinity. Declare the Trinity. It's absolutely wonderful. It'll humble your listener. It may intrigue your listener. It will clarify who you're talking about. Now, secondly, there is the importance of the Trinity. Recently in our home, we had a dinner just before we came away, and uh, our son has come away also, and so we decided to have a family dinner, and we sat around the table, and one of our children decided that we would uh, spend the, just a few minutes talking around the table and each one would say what they appreciated about each one around the table. And it was quite a good corrective to our conversation around the table, which is often sort of more jokey and uh, not particularly flattering. And yet we spent this time, and some of them, one of them had arranged for some very emotional music to be played in the background at the same time, which made it all the more traumatic, really. But. Um, <laughs> There we were talking about one another, and it was a very special time. Suddenly we realized what various members of the family thought, things that they would never express. Now I say this to you because how do you think of God? If you think of God badly, you're probably not thinking of God biblically. If you think of God feebly, you're probably not thinking of him biblically. The way we think of God has to match the reality. Otherwise, we dishonor him. And also, does it occur to you that we become like the thing we worship? So, you know, if we worship something which is little and dreadful, we ourselves will shrivel and diminish. That's why people are so sad in our streets. That's why your city and my city are marked by such shriveled people. Their horizon is so tiny and tragic. We become like the person we worship. And if we worship the Trinitarian God, then we begin to expand and develop. <coughs> and sometimes you have the privilege of watching people move like that. You remember the psalmist says, those who worship idols without the eyes, without the ears, without the mouths, without the legs, they become like them. But here's the very big issue, and uh, I hope you'll really grasp this uh, again this evening, or perhaps one or two of you for the first time. The Trinity tells us how life works. The Trinity tells us how the universe runs. And I say this for this reason. I want you to just think in your mind back to when there was no creation. Just imagine you could go back in your mind before God says, let there be. And before God says, let there be, and the creation comes into being, you've got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, what if you've just got God? Not Father, not Son, not Holy Spirit, just God. Who does he love? Well, perhaps he loves himself. But then when the creation comes along, he improves because he begins to love outwardly. 
Or perhaps you say, well, you know, he doesn't love until the creation comes along. And then he begins to love us. In fact, that's why he made us, because he needs us. But we know that's not true. No, God doesn't improve with creation. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are pre-creation and perfect and loving for all eternity before creation. And the Father is loving the Son, and the Son is loving the Father. The Father is loving the Spirit. The Spirit is loving the Father. And they're serving each other. And they're in perfection. And they're joyful. And they're harmonious. And there's no friction. And there's no inequality. And there's no abuse. Everything is absolutely wonderful. And then, because God is a loving God, He creates so you see, a relationship is bigger and more significant and before the creation. And therefore, the person who thinks that I'm in the creation because I've got to go and get the creation, whether it's a fourth house or just a fourth million or a fourth whatever, that person's made a big mistake. Because in the end, that's going to fail them. If they throw their heart, mind, soul, and strength into creation, that creation is going to fail them. It is not the ultimate reality. The person who seeks relationship is going to find reality. First with God, through Christ. Second with his people. And third, a whole new relationship attitude with those who are lost. And because God is loving at his core before the world began... Everything about him that he does is loving. Everything the Trinity does, everything the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do is loving. So when he makes the creation, he does it as a lover. And when you look at the creation, even though it's fallen, a lot of what you'll see around this beautiful city, especially to do with the parks and the creation that God has made, will say to you, this has been done by a lover. And you'll look at it with new eyes. Or think of uh, the way the Trinity works in providence, looking after you, balancing your troubles with your blessings. This is all being done by a lover. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are working out how to test and support you. Or think of how the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do your salvation. The Father adopting, the Son redeeming, the Holy Spirit giving rebirth. This is all being done by a lover. Same with revelation, that God would reveal to us the cosmos and then reveal the Son, and then by the Spirit illumine our eyes, spiritual eyes. This is all being done by a lover. And even when God comes to judge, this will be done by a lover. You'll notice that a lot of the papers have letters, at least they do in our city, and I think in yours from what I've read in the last few weeks, which get angry with God. But the God that they're angry with is not the beautiful God of the Trinity. It's normally some sort of half-baked caricature. We had a, a lady in charge of the religious affairs of uh, the Sydney Morning Herald, and she was so prejudiced against everything to do with Christianity. She just got it wrong every time. Eventually, I wrote to the letter and I said, you know, this is a piece of... It was a sarcastic letter, I'm ashamed to say, but I said, you know, this is a piece of genius, getting this lady to be in charge of religious affairs. Now you just need somebody blind to do all your art reporting and somebody deaf to do all your music reporting. And she rang me from her office and she said, what didn't you like about my music reporting? I said, I'm sorry, I'm not sure that we're on the right wavelength. I'm just a, a simple pastor saying that as you write on Christian affairs, you either don't have the faculties to understand them or you don't have the willingness to interpret them. And I'd be very glad to come and have lunch with you and explain Christianity to you. But of course, there was no great interest in that. So there is the need of the, there is the fact of the Trinity and the need of the Trinity. And the third thing this evening I want to talk to you about, uh, did I just get that wrong? I did. I said the fact of the Trinity, the importance of the Trinity, and now the need of the Trinity, the need of the Trinity. 
And I say this to you because um, Jim Packer says in one of his articles, a very helpful sentence, he says, you cannot state the gospel rightly if you grasp the Godhead wrongly. You cannot state the gospel rightly if you grasp the Godhead wrongly. And in that little book downstairs, which is sometimes called Enjoying the Trinity, or sometimes called The Good God by Michael Reeves, he asks this question, is it possible that in our culture today, the Western world, there is the diminishing of understanding of the Trinity and a rising of hostility against some other God? I think that's a very interesting question. Are the two of them going hand in hand? If we do have a good grasp of the Trinity, including relationships as the key to life, I think this will set many people free from the pursuit of materialism and the great loneliness. I watch some of the men and the women in our church and they haven't yet seen the attractiveness of Jesus Christ. They haven't yet seen the treasure in the field. They haven't yet seen the pearl of great price. So they're just going for what they do see and it's just not working and it's affecting their homes but a good grasp of the Trinity would set many people free. A good grasp of the Trinity, including relationships, would help many marriages. Because suddenly a man would see that he can serve his wife without diminishing himself in any way. Because the son is able to submit to the father without receiving any inequality or anything which is embarrassing or degrading, but wonderful. And the domestic violence in our city and probably in yours is escalating. And we've lost the whole concept of joyful submission and loving leadership. And it's all modeled for us beautifully in the Trinity. And it should spill over into the churches and be a testimony to the wider world. So a good grasp of the Trinity would perhaps help in many homes. A good grasp of the Trinity would also help our discussions with non-Christian people on difficult issues. You know, think of the difficult discussion of same-sex marriage. How difficult it is to get into the discussion. You find yourself on the back foot. But just imagine that we were talking not so much about what we were against as what we were so grateful for. Imagine if the world heard us talking about the absolute privilege of knowing God the Father, Jesus the Savior, the Holy Spirit the Comforter. And they heard us saying, we are so grateful for this relationship that we wouldn't want anyone else to miss out. And that might translate into, don't go that direction, go this direction, with very good reason. A good grasp of the Trinity might also lead us to, better win to a better witness. As I say, we may be talking to people and discover that they're angry with the God who they ought to be angry with. But they would not want to reject the love of the Father, the redemption of the Son, the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And maybe we owe it to our friends to help them enter a little more into the riches of the Trinity. Now, most of you will know the name Thomas Chalmers because there's a great statue to him in Edinburgh. Was he a pastor in this church at the Tron? The original Tron. So the second most famous pastor that this church has ever had, probably. <laughs> and uh, you probably know that Thomas Chalmers, great man, was a clergyman who had no interest really in gospel things, even when he was in the ministry. And then he got very sick. And when he was sick, he went to bed with some good books. And he emerged from his sick bed a transformed man. And he was so zealous for the gospel that in the original Tron, they sometimes had to feed him in the window because there were so many people waiting to listen to him. And he said a very wonderful thing, which you'll have perhaps heard many times. And he said this, he said, don't try and talk your pagan friends out of their pleasure or out of their plenty, because that's all they can see. Show them something of the beauty of Christ. Help them to have a new affection because the new affection will expel the old affection. And maybe as we think more carefully about the Trinity 
and see the hand of the three persons on all the aspects of the world and salvation and providence and the kingdom and revelation and church and home and work, we'll begin to feel and maybe express the great privilege and, and joy that it is to know Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So there's uh, just a little introduction to the subject. You might like to think more carefully and read more carefully. Let's pray. Our gracious God, we thank you for revealing yourself as one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we pray that you would save us from having poor views of yourself, of being diminished in heart because of idolatry. We pray that you would save us from having a faulty direction in the way we live. We pray that you would save us from having a cheap gospel in the way we speak. And we pray that in your great love and power, you continue to teach us that we would see more clearly, love more dearly, and follow more nearly. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to close this evening by singing once again the hymn on the screens, which takes us back before the world began and leads us forward to the coming of Christ in councils of eternity before all worlds were formed.
Well, let's pray. May indeed the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with us all now and always. Amen.